Afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all keeping well. Uh, we will kick off at three minutes past with the introductions just to allow some people some time to join in. Um, so if you haven't made your cup of tea or coffee yet, you've got a minute to do so. Um, we'll see you at three minutes past. Okay, we are going to get going. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is keeping well and warm in this crazy weather. If you are in, in Joburg, um, it is particularly chilly this morning with some overcloud showers as well. Um, my name is Daniela Borges. I am a corporate account manager for Kayelo. Um, I'm joined today by Tracy Niklos. He is a business strategist, facilitator, mentor, coach. The list goes on and on and on. But some of my favorite things is he's, he's published a book as well. He's got a particular keen interest in neuroscience. So very much looking forward to, to chatting to Tracy today. Um, I, we actually had a joke this morning in the office that uh, uh, yet another Tracy facilitator. So no, Kayelo does not only uh, facilitate with Tracy's. It is completely coincidental. Um, so Tracy, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm very grateful to have you here with us today um, and looking very forward to the topic. Excellent, Danny. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And um, I'm going to be making reference to the other Tracy during the conversation today. So yeah, clearly Tracy's. Um, being the month of November, we're looking at, at men primarily and men's mental health. And today's conversation is just that, it's a conversation. So please feel free and safe to ask questions, participate in the polls, questionnaires, etc. Any part participation is completely anonymous the interactive platform only provides comments or questions of participants, no personal details. Just before we get going, I would like to just draw attention, please. If there's anyone in the audience or uh, who's possibly suffering with mental health or knows of somebody suffering with mental health, 
in one of the, the January webinar, there's a talk on coaching. Please take the time out to go online and check it out. Or uh, you can go onto the Ask Nelson platform and engage with the counselor for help. Please do not ignore this. If it's for you or for someone that you know, do please just step forward and, and engage with Ask Nelson or take a look at that webinar. So, men's psychosocial health. Big word, ostensibly we're looking at how the brain works, our mental ability and how it influences our health. So, if the primary function of the brain is to ensure survival, how do we take the proverbial fear of threat out of the equation so as to facilitate a balanced cognitive ability, despite having to probably daily face an overwhelming physiological, emotional, and societal tidal wave? What with having to deal with family pressures, be vigilant to high crime, negotiate work targets and deadlines, etc. Self-awareness and emotional regulation provide a step change to stand up and step up in changing our mindsets and how we do life forever. When I saw this photo, one of the first questions that came to mind was, what shadow do each one of us want to cast in life? This was promptly followed by the thought, how much of oneself can we lose in creating our respective future? Reflectively, my mind then meandered onto what will define who we become and what story will our headstone tell? And as you're looking at the slide whilst I talk, you probably have your own divergence thoughts filtered through your individual life experiences, your hopes, your fears, your joy. So, question for self. Are you on track with your dreams? as they pertain to at home, at work, and play. We're going to take the time out now to uh, do a poll uh, with regards to this, and Dan is going to manage that for us. And uh, please do participate uh, on this. And then whilst we're doing that, I'm going to actually put Danny a bit on the line over here, Danny, and ask, um, are you on track with your dreams as they pertain to at home, at work and play, and if not, why not? And if perchance they are, please share with us what are those elements that have um, assisted you in getting your dreams on track and then been able to stay on track? Over to you, Danny. Thanks, JC. Um, so, so I, I, I want to point out for me, it feels like each of those could be interpreted on an individual level, work, home and play. For me, home, I interpreted it as, as physical home. Um, my, my, my goals and dreams were to in, invest in property and um, hopefully one day have a portfolio of property to manage. Um, and I've made a small step towards it, invested in my first one. So I, I think I would say yes on, on home. Uh, when it comes to work, I feel like the goalpost for, for my work dreams changes Oh, geez, so often that it feels like there's always something new that I'm, I'm chasing. So I would, I would say no on work. Um, but also in the same token, I feel like I'm doing work that serves me and serves a greater purpose in the world um, through through, what's, through what Kayala offers. So um, currently as it stands, yes for work. Um, however, if you maybe ask me next week, maybe not. Um, <laughs> Play, um, I'd say yes. I, I interpret play as things that give me doing activities that give me joy, spending time with with people that that give me joy and bring out the best version of me. So I'd say yes. I, I would say overwhelmingly, my answer is yes. There are elements of no, but I would think overwhelmingly yes. <laughs> Overall, yes. But that's fantastic. And in your discussion, you actually bring forward those elements that contribute in a positive way for assisting you to get on track and to stay on track. And that's really wonderful. So thank you for sharing for sharing that. Just whilst you're looking at that, are, is there any, are you getting any information coming through on the questions to the audience that uh, yes. people are? Yeah, we've got some, um, 
So it's divided into yes and no percentages. Um, we've got 30% of people saying yes, they are on track with their dreams, while 69% uh, say no. So quite a lot saying no. Yes. Yeah. I wonder, so, so, so I wonder if, if maybe the reasons they could put, if you're wanting to or open to, to put in, in the chat why it is no. I see someone's put there saying that their divorce has been a setback for them. Um, yeah. Could be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think you know, in asking the question, the idea is really an enabler to help us to look at uh, where, just to get back in in sync with what our dreams were, because life happens, a divorce happens, and it just becomes so consuming. It steals our energy, it steals our dream, our momentum, our way forward. And uh, for me, asking the question is just for us to reassess and say, well, hold on a sec, I haven't lost my dream in spite of what I've gone through. And hey, here's a wake up call for, I need to get my life back on track again. And whatever it is that's coming our way, it's, it's easy to say, of course, life is tough. It's really difficult. We take a knock. Are we resilient enough to get back up again and, and still chase our dream? As you said, with your work, I can ask you today, um, not as heavy as, as a divorce, but I can ask you today and you'd say yes and possibly next week it would be no. And it is, life happens, but by and by are we managing to, to stay on track with that? Are there any other uh, other uh, things that have come through on that, Um Another comment saying that, um, Colleen, I know Colleen personally, very close, um, just doesn't have enough time during the day um, and feels drained at night that could be contributing to not not feeling like you're on track with your dreams definitely congratulations okay I, I missed that in i was talking over you what was that last comment to danny somebody's saying that they're a new mom uh, oh, oh, which, oh boy oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay Okay, excellent. And and uh, our conversation is going to continue um, around that in getting to understand more. And, and hopefully in our conversation, in being able to transition, at least begin that journey on getting back on track again. So I, I don't know, I'm assuming most people in the audience have heard of Mahatma Gandhi. He is a prominent statesman. I suppose in today's terminology, he'd be referred to as a social warrior. But he has so much more than a social warrior. Mahatma Gandhi, he put his life on the line um, for what he believed in and how life should be lived and society should be uh, good. And I, I really like um, the following that he put together. Um, he talks about where your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, and your values becomes your destiny. And essentially, our beliefs are, are where we are now. Um, our beliefs are made up of what's happened to us in life from the date of birth to where we are today that defines what we believe and, and this goes around. So essentially, where we allow our mind to play is where our destiny will be. And it, and that's quite significant where are we on track with our dreams or aren't we? Um, do we need to refocus where we allow our minds to play? Because that is what where our destiny will be. And uh, just a light bulb moment uh, in that if we change our belief system, we can change how we do life. So it's in just where we focus our mind, where we put our energy in, where we put our time in, etc. That's where we're going to end up. And that's important for all of us. So psychosocial health. Today, I know we look, we're talking about males, primarily because it's November and focuses on males. Understand we have a mixed audience of males and females. And um, so please be bear with me. The conversation is going to be more pointed towards males. But at the same token, understand that um, if a huge majority of males and females, our makeup, our, our mental makeup is actually very similar. Yes, males have 
idiosyncrasies in one direction specifics, just as do women. And when they mesh together, uh, hopefully we get the sum of the parts outweighs the value of the individual pieces. So, um, so do contribute. It is a conversation. Ask questions. There's somebody manning uh, computer questions that we can try and address that you might have. Um, and hopefully, um, ladies will get a bit of an insight into how the man's mind works. Um, always an interesting conversation, that one. So what we're looking at today is, is the social, uh, psychosocial health, and we're looking to change mindsets for success. So to change mindsets for success, we really need, we have to ostensibly understand what is psychosocial health. Um, so a couple of pointers. What does the term actually mean? You know, all too often society gives out a label for something and we don't necessarily know what it means and we might be a bit too embarrassed to ask, what is this? Can you define it? And so we nod our heads and we go on. But I think it's important. We can't address a problem if we actually don't know what the exact problem is. So what does the term psychosocial health entail? Is it really serious? If I'm a victim of it, can the issue or issues be corrected? Now, before we go into the, the fundamentals of the mental health that we're looking at, I want to give you a bit of an anecdotal commentary on the financial burden of mental health. In 2010 in Australia, the Australian government had a study carried out and um, the result of which determined that the psychosocial health cost to the nation, so their GDP took a negative knock of just short of 15 billion, that's with a B, billion Australian dollars. In RAND terms, this is 12 years ago, bear in mind, in RAND terms, that was 180 billion Rand. We take that same number and we take a look at the cost of that in today's terms in rands, that's 324 billion rand in today's terms. Now, bear in mind, that would be the conditions as applicable to Australia. And we all know that South Africa has far greater problems when it comes to psychosocial health than what Australia will ever have. So just look at the financial impact on our economy, on our communities of what this is costing the rest of the conversation is going to be drilling down and look at the individual and community uh, uh, impact that that has. So the components of psychosocial health, so mental health, emotional health, social health, and spiritual health. Today, we're going to be looking at primarily mental, emotional, and delving into social health. And... Um, I'm not going to go into the specifics of, of, um, of drilling down too deep, but rather getting a sense of what this is about. But there's so many mitigating factors that influence those, those um, states of health, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual, and really the interdependence of, of those elements where it is important that we're able to look at and, and get balance in that. And when... Uh, Onslaught comes away, life happens, et cetera, that we're able to get back to balance again in, in that environment. So what are some of the factors influencing psychosocial health? We look at strong versus disruptive family environment. We look at toxic versus positive community interaction. We look at societal and generational norms and locus of control. So firstly, strong versus disruptive family environment. You could have grown up in a, a, a lovely, stable household environment where you have a mother and a father and, and siblings. Um, you don't lack for anything. Um, you're well cared for mentally, physically, emotionally. And um, you're encouraged. It's a disciplined environment. It's a safe environment. You're involved in sport. You're, in, uh, you're built up. You, your self-confidence is fantastic. You could have all that. You could be blessed with having all that in your life. The opposite is you could grow up in a broken home. You 
could maybe be looked after by an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, possibly not even a parent. You could grow up in an orphanage. You could grow up in an environment where there's alcohol abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, there's um, looking at communities. You could be looking in a really a uh, safe environment to grow up in or a very toxic environment. There's gang warfare, you can't go out in the streets, people doing drugs, um, a whole multitude of elements that, that come into play. And each one of us experience different elements of that that talk into what our, body, our beliefs become. And then societal and generational norms, I say it with a smile on my face because um, I don't know what the age group of the audience is, but anyone that interacts with somebody who's 20 or 30 years older or younger than themselves understand that there's always, um, between the, the ages, there's always a different perspective or so often a different perspective uh, or take on, on societal norms. Um, an example, as I was, when I was a youngster, I recall, a comment being made that children should be seen and not heard. Um, or um, what's another good example I could think of? Yeah, if, if somebody, as a kid, if somebody came to the room, I, an adult came to the room, I would stand up and greet them as a sign of respect. Or um, I would, and I still do, um, would open the door for someone. Uh, those elements aren't necessarily acknowledged or, or seen as important nowadays, whereas as, as a youngster for me, those are things that were, were important. And then we're going to uh, discuss locus, locus of control. I'm just going to go into that a, a little bit. Um, I uh, Locus of control, I don't really wish to get involved uh, or go into the theoretical construct of locus of control uh, and deal with the psychological profiling, but there are certain elements of locus, locus of control that um, is put into our, germane to our conversation of today. So what is locus of control? It's the degree to which people believe that they, as opposed to external forces, have control over the outcomes of their lives. Right. The degree to which people believe that they, as opposed to external forces, have control over their own lives. So let's look at locus of control, external versus internal uh, forces. Uh, strong external locus of control is when some believes what happens to them is luck or faith with everything due to external forces in the environment, i.e. they are not in control. And that versus a strong internal locus of control when some believes they are in control of what happens to them. And so their actions are likely to have a positive effect on the environment. Now, I'd just like to say with locus, locus of control that there's no one person that can ever be in total control because there's always going to be life happens. There's always going to be elements that they are not in control, of, but the mindset is how they handle that. And the same thing with the external control. There's always, we can't always go through life saying um, all control is beyond me because they are clearly, we make decisions over which we do have control. So a question for self. I think this is another poll we're looking at, Danny. Do you generally live your life according to luck, chance, and or coincidence? And that would be a one. Or do you more often take charge, control, and destiny? And then that would be a two. And then whilst you're doing that, Danny, if you could um, also just maybe yield some of your leanings in respect of local control and possibly share some of your insights, perspective you've gained through your life experiences. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think... <laughs> my immediate answer would be, it depends on what day of the week it is. Saturdays or Sundays, I live my life according to coincidence. Whatever happens, happens. I'm not really too phased. Where's Monday to Friday? Okay, this has got to happen. That's going to happen. Uh, but no, on a, on a serious note, I think I, I like to take control. I, I'm a control freak. I like to know what's happening, when it's happening. I get complete FOMO when there's things happening that I'm not a, a part of. Or I don't know what's happening. So I would definitely say I take more charge, take control. I often put measures in place in my own life to, to create outcomes that I want um, in my life. Um, both my parents are like that as well. So it's 
as you mentioned, part of my experience is that's the normal for me. Um, it works out more often than not. Um, sometimes when it doesn't, I think it hits a lot harder when you are living that way inclined. Um, I think when you're living your life flowing in what come what may, um, the hits are a little lighter. Um, but yes, I, I think taking charge and control of my destiny would definitely be where I'm living. Okay. All right. Where would you and say you are? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a definitely a, a take charge uh, person of my own destiny. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to say that I'm not a control freak. At least I don't believe I am. <laughs> Went off my family. Um, but uh, having said that, what is so important for me is that, um, of course, life happens and I take cognizance of that in my decision making. But uh, taking charge also means that when when we are faced with the knocks in life, um, we don't wait for a handout or a hand up from someone else. We, we are constantly looking at options for getting back on our feet again and moving forward. And that, that's resilience that we engender in, in that decision making. And I think that's quite important. Um, if I take a look at our nation, um, so things are generally so resilient and um, bounce back from so much adversity. It really, as a nation, we stand out in the crowd. Um, we're an incredible nation of people, South Africa is. And I, I think I'm interested to see those polls, by the way, but I'm sure that, that, um, my comment is probably indicative of the average person's outlook to life. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. You couldn't have been more right. We've got an 84% on the yeah. taking control and a 15 on the luck yeah. and chance. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I wanted to point out that although I, I think a lot of us are in the taking charge of control, I wonder if you would agree with me that I think maybe living your life in accordance to chance, um, coincidence, is putting you more in, for argument's sake, a flow state. Um, where, where things are happening as, as they were meant to happen. Um, and I think, ideally, I would like to be in that way. I would like to live, you know, put measures in place to have the things that I need, but live so that things that are supposed to happen, happen. Um, and flow through life, if that makes sense. I, I, a word that comes to mind as you're speaking, and I don't want you to take this up the wrong way because I'd hate to trigger you into the negative. Um, <laughs> utopia. <laughs> and uh, I think it would be lovely if we could, but life does happen. Um, you know, we were talking earlier on, on, on things that can happen in life and how dramatic it is in our life, etc. cetera. And um, um, we'll never be able to control that. I, I, I would think, Sorry, from my perspective, anyway, not what I think about that, but my perspective is that if we're able to find our purpose in life, and and because that if we find our purpose in life, that triggers our passion in life, and that inspires us in life, and no matter what comes our way, we're able to ride that wave. We might fall off the board occasionally, but we get back on again, and we carry on, and nothing takes us down. And I, that to me is just my outlook to life but um uh, it would be fantastic but um if if we if if everything just happened the way it should happen i don't know would it really be life if we have no you know if the butterfly doesn't have to struggle out, out to get out of the cocoon it will never fly if the chick doesn't have to beat its way out of its eggshell with its, its beak it would never be able to eat so i kind of look at that and i say that's that, that's a good replication of life. That's that's what it's about. But that's just my own, my own perspective. Uh, like a yin, yin, yin and yang. It, it, it is. You know, uh, there's, uh, uh, we can be dealt a good card, we can be dealt a bad card, and it's our attitude to life, um, our belief system that dictates how we address the good and the bad. It can either overwhelm us, or we can just like, we go through the pain, but we rise to the top and we carry on. 100%. I, um, there's a comment in the in the chat box, which I quite agree with. Um, yeah. and, and, and it goes as follows. I think that they go hand in hand, both the lack and the control. Um, in some way, taking charge and control of, of your life uh, creates luck and improves potential positive chances 
chances and coincidences. I couldn't agree with it more. Thank you. That's a great perspective. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. So um, great. And my, and and really nice commentary coming back. So um, thank you very much for that participation from the audience as well. And thanks for your input, Danny. I appreciate that. So um, we're now going to move on to the next slide and we look at the perceived link between control and health. And uh, so there is a powerful link apparently between perceived control and health. And the more that someone believes their actions determine their future, the more likely they are to engage in healthy behaviors. For example, like eating well and exercising regularly. If on the other hand, they feel like they have no control, then they experience negative symptoms like stress, anxiety, and depression. So let's look at some healthy lifestyle traits. When we take a look at people that, that live a healthy lifestyle, lifestyle traits, um, they're generally very optimistic. They have a positive outlook to life. They like themselves. They have a high self-esteem and, and respect. They accept their mistakes. Um, they hold themselves responsible, accountable, and, and look for ways to improve. They take care of themselves. They diet, they exercise, they endeavor to get adequate sleep. They have empathy empathy for others, they are compassionate, and they self-regulate around, they control their anger, hate, tension, and anxiety. So they subordinate their the own issues and self-regulate around that. That's, those are healthy lifestyle traits. Poor lifestyle traits, we have low self-esteem, we allow others to walk over us, we have poor personal habits, we avoid risk taking. We are overly sensitive. We blame others for our mistakes. We don't take responsibility for our actions and words. I'm sure most of us have heard the comment, negative things just happen to me. We play the victim card. We prefer to be led by others. And we prefer to be led by others, of course, because we want to avoid risk taking. We're prone to stress, anxiety, and depression. We are disengaged. We have low resilience. So our ability to bounce back from, uh, from, from being overwhelmed um, is a problem. We struggle to bounce back again. And we're pessimistic. We have a, a low outlook to life. So to take charge of our psychosocial health, what are the things that we should be looking at? We want to have solid, entrenched beliefs and values in life. We want to know how to relate to others. We want to know how to respond to incidents in our lives. So that's all very interesting. But so that's the what that we've been looking at. But how do we change the mindsets? That's the question we need to be asking ourselves. So we understand now the what, now we look at the how. Well, the challenge in changing mindsets is that our brains have a mind of their own. Or singular, our brain has a mind of its own, which is a bit of a challenge because we almost end up fighting against ourselves. So if we just go back and look at the evolution of knowledge and learning over the last 100 years, we, for decades, focus in the boardroom was on employing people with a high IQ, intellectual proudness. Organizations went out that employed these top, top IQ people and only to find that the studies show, well, not just studies, but reality showed that uh, the ineffectiveness of that because despite having people with all the high IQ, companies were still not being successful. They weren't achieving the results that they needed to achieve. Unfortunately, in 1995, Dr. Daniel Goldman introduced introduced us to emotional intelligence. Now, Dr. Daniel Goleman wasn't the, if I could call it, the founder of emotional intelligence, but what he certainly did is he succinctly um, brought together the, the issues addressed within emotional intelligence, and he put forward five criteria in that, and then he brought that message out into the marketplace. And um, that was fantastic. And now, actually, we know that thanks to neuroscience, that our brains are actually firstly social entities before anything else. And no, 
matter the amount of focus uh, paid to any thing we're trying to achieve in life in business we will it will never be successful unless we address those domains those uh, social entities first that we need to look at but now i'm going to spend a bit of time just looking at emotional intelligence because that forms in the framework of social intelligence as well so the emotional intelligence which we said we're going to be looking at today is social awareness knowing what we are feeling at any given time and understanding the impact these moves have on others so that's our self awareness that we are going to be looking at how do our brains react to stimuli positive negative stimuli we then look at self regulation controlling or redirecting our emotions anticipating consequences before acting on impulse so we understand our through our own awareness we understand what are the issues that are triggering us to anger or to calmness or joy happiness uh, unhappiness and then we are learning to regulate around that so that we can we maintain an equilibrium in our lives and those people around us so those two elements the self awareness and self regulation are criteria that we're looking at and then down the road we we start learning more about motivation as in utilizing these emotional factors to achieve goals enjoying the learning process and perseverance in the face of obstacles and then empathy sensing the emotions of others now guys women are phenomenal with this they are women are so much more empathetic than men and men folk in the audience we really have to learn to subordinate our egos and and learn to be empathetic for whether it's our partners our, our wives our kids our neighbors our coworkers etc so critically important and then social skills managing relationships inspiring others and in juicing desired responses from them those are motivation empathy and social skills those are um issues that we learn down the line once we've understood and come to grips with self awareness and self regulation and as it all five of these elements are uh, part of what daniel goleman brought into the uh, our environment under emotional intelligence and they form all five of them form part of uh social quotient uh from neuroscience so our brain the social organ the role of the brain is to keep us alive and safe no two brains are alike we all react differently to stimuli based on our individual life experiences so going back to the beliefs that we were talking about we even came back as far back as the picture with the boots and the shadow and asking are we on track with where we should be that our beliefs mahatma gandhi goes around full circle come to our destiny so all those issues talk into how our brains react differently individually from the stimuli that comes to us and then the brain has drivers that automatically trigger a response because the role of the brain is to keep us alive and safe it's all about survival for self preservation the brain is wired to avoid threat and approach will be drawn towards a reward state anything out of the norm is instinctively perceived as a threat anything out of our norm is perceived to be a threat so in your environment you could just hypothetically you could have somebody that comes in from another country they could have a light skin or a dark skin they could have a different hairstyle uh, they could speak a different language uh, they don't understand our norms our south norms uh, so many uh, so many elements that come into play that trigger our brains to threat Uh, which our brain wants to uh, wants to avoid our brain wants to avoid threat so we, we start panicky anything out of our norm is treated as a threat so this slide shows our primitive caveman brain which is wired for survival of self 
family, and community. Threat produces a limbic response of flight, fight, and freeze. An example of this could be um, you're in the office and you get a phone call to go to the boss's office. Um, I don't know how many people in the audience would think, oh my goodness me, I wonder what I'm going to be rewarded for today. If the average person, I'm, I'm quite sure, would think, oh boy, what have I done wrong this time? That's the default of our brain. Um, or you walk in through the field at night time and you hear a rustle in the bush. The average person wouldn't be thinking, oh, there's potential of um, grabbing an animal or something for a meal later on. No, it's self-preservation. We're either going to run like mad or we're going to turn around and fight. Or our brain becomes so overwhelmed that we just freeze like the proverbial deer in a headlight. We can't actually even think of what we should do because, well, we can't. And we'll go through that in the conversation just now, why we can't. So, um, <clears throat> and and then also interesting enough, uh, an anecdotal uh, way, so that our, um, our brains receiving threat messages uh, for physical and social pain use the same neural pathways to message. So um, that gives us understanding why sometimes um, when we are, uh, we face a traumatic experience and it's a traumatic social uh, or mental experience, we feel like somebody has hit us in the gut because our brain doesn't distinguish between physical and emotional trauma in our lives. Very interesting, you know. So our new thinking neuroplastic advanced brain that has evolved over thousands of years of development lends itself and can enhance self-control, judgment, emotional regulation, and cognitive awareness. So this advanced brain is phenomenal. It's our thinking brain. The question that we continue to ask, of course, is, so if our brain has evolved so much, why does our caveman brain invariably still hold center stage in stressful situations? And what can we do to change this performance and engage our advanced thinking brain more constructively? We consciously or unconsciously decide as to what we will allow to trigger an angry or emotional response to a stressful situation. This is a contributing factor for self-gratification, just by the by. That's all about me and my needs first. Scientific studies now inform us that as our brains are social entities and are neuroplastic in design, we can create new neural pathways, entrenching positive mindsets and allowing the negative defaults to atrophy through disuse and die off. Now, Tracy Hobbs, who did a, a webinar last year, at last year, last month, I mean, um, was talking just about this, about creating new habits. She was talking about a path through the field or a forest and um, how uh, it's a clear-cut path because we use it every single day. But when we want to create a new uh, pathway, we initially start walking through the grass and the vegetation, etc. But the more we walk on the new path, so the clearer it becomes, and as that becomes clearer, the old path just becomes overgrown and fades back into nature. And that's exactly what happens with our brains. So we create a new neural pathway. We don't try and fix a bad habit. We create a new habit. And we create a new neural pathway. And the more we work that neural pathway, the stronger it becomes. And the old pathway, that just atrophies and dies off. <clears throat> The care K model. Scientific findings highlight five domains or drivers, engagement drivers in the brain that can be triggered singularly or collectively, positively or negatively. If a person's engagement drivers receive a negative experience, the threat circuitry of the brain is activated. The opposite is triggered for positive experience. And this care K model provides a practical understanding of this phenomenon. So those engagement drivers, these five engagement drivers, care K, C A R E K, that's choice, empowerment, assurance, security, reputation, recognition, equality, fairness, kinship, acquiescence. So this is not unique to a specific person. 
studies have shown, and these studies have been carried out in neuroscientific, neuroscientific laboratories around the world where all this data has been uh, gathered. Everyone, every human have these five engagement drives that are triggered negatively towards threat activation or positively towards reward engagement. So what happens when singularly or collectively one to five or all five if, if need be, of these uh, engagement drivers are triggered negatively into threat activation? Well, firstly, the glucose and oxygen drains from our brains and just goes to our extremities to facilitate that fight, flight, not the freeze. Because why do we freeze? Because the glu glucose oxygen has left our brain. There is, this is an emotional uh, um, uh, fear response. There's no cognitive ability. We can't collaborate with anyone because everyone is the enemy. We certainly can't pay attention and because our mind's all over the show and we certainly cannot emotionally regulate. We are stuck in a fear quadrant. We are overwhelmed. And what we see happening is we have, we see uh, uh, increased cortisol levels. Now, cortisol, uh, increased cortisol levels will, in the short term, it will uh, actually enhance, even enhance our, 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 our eyesight so that in that flight mode, we're able to actually see better where we run into. Um, but of course, uh, uh, longer term cortisol is very destructive. Our body is really bad and uh, talks into mental fatigue, anxiety and uh, agitation. We're so stressed, we're agitated. The absolute opposite of that is when those engagement drivers are triggered positively towards a reward state, we have good levels of dopamine spiking. So we're feeling awesome. We're feeling on top of the world because of the dopamine. Cognitive resource, we, our brains are firing, our neurons are firing, our brains are working over time. We have clarity, positive. We can see what's going on. We experience joy. It's great. Life is great. So on that note, question for self. Using that KK model, share which of your five domains or engagement drivers are triggered, negatively triggered, perhaps take time to consider why. I think this might be a poll and a question. And I'm going to um, then go on to, yeah, uh, this, I'm just giving this back to you again as you're doing that. Uh, Danny, if, um, I just want to give more words in there. For choice, we're looking at empowerment, autonomy, uh, under assurance, it's security or certainty. Reputation, it's recognition, your status. Equality, that fairness, impartiality is the consistent in treatment, the way you're treated. Um, and kinship, acquiescence, that's relatedness, inclusivity, belonging, that sense of belonging for everyone. If you can just please uh, look at those questions or polls, I can't remember what, what we're dealing with here. And then maybe, Danny, whilst we're doing that, you could, I could put you on the spot again and maybe just share with us um, some of your um, the engagement drives that are triggered negatively and, and why you think that might be. Thanks. Thanks, Tracy. Um, off the top of my head, um, I, I would definitely say the um, equality one um, and fairness. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I think of why, um, I've recently been exposed to uh, friends' children who are born with, with cancer. And I was so triggered by this that I couldn't, I, 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 there was no answer. I couldn't understand what, what was happening. It doesn't make any sense to me. These children come into the world um, by, no, by no choice of their own are handed really unfair cards. Um, and, and I've done a bit of research on it. And, you know, the more, the more looking into it, the more it's, it's a prevalent thing. Um, so, so I know there's some pages out there. That, um, what is it? What is it? Name? Mighty Mac, for example, another child born with cancer. Those things all trigger my, my, um, equality and fairness, um, engagement driver. So for me, that would be my biggest top one in saying so. I think I, I'm a little triggered by all of them. But my, my most prevalent one would be the uh, equality and fairness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that is interesting. And um, we spoke about that earlier on. I don't want to say anything too much before we get some results out of the polls or the questions that were asked. But um, yeah, and, and we can have all five of those 
domain, so those engagement drivers being triggered negatively and or positively. And obviously, the more of them that are triggered, the more difficult it becomes to bounce back. Or, um, you know, and uh, inversely, the more of them that are, are triggered towards the reward state, um, so we we just absolutely fly. And, you know, we, we almost become invincible, um, not in an arrogant way, but I mean, we just fire in all cylinders, we're really moving ahead and, and things are going great. So, yeah, and, and sometimes it doesn't take much to just trigger something to the negative either, though. Yeah, it could be I'm, I'm, I must say, I'm very impressed with this model that you've put together, Tracy. I, I, I know it's something that you published in your book, so it's, it's very interesting and very, I think, um, apt for a lot of people in the audience. Um, if I look at our, our uh, responses to our poll, um, as you predicted, fairness is sitting on top, the equality is sitting on top at 34%. Um, yeah. Second place, we got the reputation uh, with 28%. Yeah. Uh, following that, the assurance, choice, and kinship. Um, I, I want to pose a question to you, Tracy. Is are, are these um, engagement tri drivers um, triggered differently by men than female, or is it a case of um, every human being is a product of their their experiences or the the factors influencing their psychosocial health, which then drive these triggers? Is it is it either or or general? Okay. Uh, so it's it's certainly not based on male or female. It's not based on gender. It's definitely based on the experience that each of us, because no one person's experience is the same as the next one. And that all talks into our belief system and how we handle on sort of life, whatever form it might take. So it's that very much dictates, and our mindset on how we respond to that dictates uh, the influence. But these five domains our every human being has these five engagement drives that are triggered negatively or, or, or positively. But I, I, I the the, um, the depth to which it's triggered, if that makes sense, the uh, not aggression to which it's triggered, that's not, I can't think of the right word now, um, is really dictated by our beliefs and uh, what we've been exposed to in our, up till today, our beliefs. Oh, thank you. We've, we've also got another interesting question within our Q&A box. Um, yes. How linked is our social and emotional intelligence and our adaptability? Um, and, and further to that question, how can we shift or, or trick our mindset uh, when, when faced with a perceived threat um, as a potential reward? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That's tricky old tricks, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our minds have a brain of their own. Um, just before I answer that, I do, I just noticed that we've actually gone over our hour, and um, I'm sorry about that, folks. I'm, I apologize. I know that you put you set your time aside for an hour, and I'm hoping you can bear with us. It's not too much longer, but this is such, uh, this is such an important topic, and it, it so affects every single one of us daily and our futures. So um, uh, firstly, the question is, um, our outlook to life does dictate our resilience to life. So um, when we have uh, high self-esteem, high self-esteem is, is how we see that we do life versus confidence, which other people see how they think we do life. and it's that strength of character that talks into our ability to be resilient and bounce back. Getting to grips with these engagement drivers and, and, and in this next part of the conversation we're going to have um, really does, we'll see it again and again, as we onboard this new way of thinking and doing, we will see that we become more resilient, not just to, we become resilient to life, but we also become more creative about how we do life. Mm -hmm. So we will get to the point where um, we don't have to try and kid our brain, but we, what we are able to do is so much easier rise to the surface because life's always going to happen. You know, uh, we can't, uh, uh, um, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, a poor example of a good example. Um, we can't have adversity come our way and say, oh, it's an ice cream, I'm okay. What we've got to be is be honest about it, but 
uh, we can be innovative about how we uh, um, address and handle and respond to that, that, that onslaught and move forward. And I think that's a far more endearing way because that talks into our conversation moving forward as well. So I'm not, uh, if we ever post that question, if by the end of the talk, you don't feel I've answered your question, please feel free to ask it again and we'll have another knock at it. But I do believe that the next couple of slides are gonna talk directly into that. Thank, thank you, Tracy. Okay, all right. So again, I apologize for going over time. I will try and up the ratio of slides quickly. So, um, Self-awareness, knowing which of our buttons are being pushed, those engagement drives that are triggered positively or negatively, and the understanding of why is the first step in changing our mindsets. So our brains don't like change. We can now understand why. It's because the uncertainty and threat is triggered. Okay, hello. Uh, we can, however, learn how to embrace change so we very effectively can develop change-ready mindsets. Self-awareness in this context is the first step in flexing this, this new muscle in creating neural pathways, a new way of thinking and doing. And that might really just talk partly into that question that was asked. Social and emotional regulation. Staying on top of our emotions is a basic requirement for self-leadership because self-awareness and self-regulation um, uh, is all about self-leadership. And managing our threat response allows to assess the impact on other others care care engagement drives so once we're able to sub we we become aware of our own negative triggers we're able to regulate around that we take the emotion out of the equation then all of a sudden we can look at the person that we having conflict with and we're able to pick up their uh, negative uh, the drives engagement drives that have been triggered negatively and we're able to talk into that whether it's tone body language conversation etc and get them to go into a positive cognitive ability and look what we've achieved. Now all of a sudden we can have a conversation. I absolutely love this slide choosing my response. And um, why? Because uh, we get emotional stimulus or stimuli hit in our brain because that's how we communicate brain to brain. And that signal goes into the thalamus and normally it would go straight off to, uh, to the amygdala for a, a knee-jerk reaction. Or now, self-awareness, self-regulation, etc. we're able to engage our thinking brain. We take that stimuli, the input that comes in the thalamus, we send it to the cortex, which is our thinking brain, and thinking brain then pushes out a considered or regulated response. Hello there. That is really where we want to be. Now, interestingly enough, where you can see that uh, uh, vertical black line of the arrows on, going from the thalamus to the cortex, that time frame to take to send that message from the thalamus to the cortex and then to the amygdala as opposed to straight from the thalamus to the amygdala is two fifths of a second. So the difference in a knee jerk reaction to a threat and maintaining the moral high ground is all of two fifths of a second. Who would have thought two fifths of a second? So it's important to subordinate our ego and focus our minds on the end game. What do we ultimately want to achieve? Not about self-gratification, not about retribution. What do we ultimately want to achieve? So emotional regulation strategies for cognitive change. We're building now on our newfound mental strength for a healthier mental outlook and lifestyle, onboarding new coping techniques. Well, the thinking brain, please stand up. That's always where we want to be. We want to play in the sand pit of the thinking brain. And we're looking at a strategy. The strategy is to intentionally force our brains to switch from the fear overwhelmed quadrant to our new thinking brain, thereby facilitating cognitive ability and rationality. So we've looked at the what, we've looked at the how, and now we look at the practical application. How do we actually start exercising this how do we this newfound uh, knowledge and the first one i look at you maybe many of you already use the labeling your emotion technique you're in a stressful environment you feel that you're kind of losing it you're getting heated emotional and you think of a good word that describes how you feel not just any daily word not like i'm feeling you know oh, i'm feeling angry oh, i'm feeling cross 
no, you, no, that's not good enough. Let me think. Um, mm, uh, uh, am I disappointed? No, it's not the right word. I feel so in. I just feel incensed. Well, that's a good word. Mm, incensed. So going through that process, what you've essentially done is you forced your brain to go from emotional quadrant into the thinking quadrant, the cognitive ability. You have triggered your brain from the negative to the positive. All of a sudden, you're able to look at the situation without the emotion and continue your conversation in a constructive manner. Isn't that fantastic? Because when we subordinate that, we're able to see whoever we're speaking with, we're able to pick up immediately those engagement drivers of theirs that are triggered negatively, talking to them, get them to engage positively, and we move forward in our conversation, constructive conversation. The second strategy, we're just dealing with these two strategies, is distancing. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that expression, um, there's a meeting going on in a room and somebody says, I'd love to be the fly on the wall that unobtrusive, unobtrusive fly on the wall where you can hear and see what's going on. And in this situation, the, the distancing is you're in a room, um, uh, temples are starting to get raised, etc. cetera. And uh, what you're doing is you're saying, I want to be the fly on the wall. And you're, you're physically moving your body up to be that fly on the wall. And you can see you're the fly on the wall and you're looking down on what's going down. And just that distancing, you are effectively taking your mind out of that overwhelmed, frantic state, that, that quadrant, into positive state. And again, once you're in that state, your emotions are no longer controlling you. Your brain, clear thinking, new brain is looking at the situation and saying, oh, I can see what that person's problem is. Let me speak into it into a rational way and I can change your mindset. So, the last one we look at is create an instant habit. Yes, it sounds a bit of a contradiction, but we can create an instant habit. And the more we work at it, the better we become. So how many of you have stepped away from a confrontational situation and you think, oh man, I should have said this, I should have done that. And why didn't I think of that? Well, hopefully now you understand why. You couldn't because you're stuck in the emotional quadrant. You, there's no balanced cognitive ability when you're stuck in the emotional quadrant. So what you can do when you replay in that video in your mind and you come to the point where you feel that you should have inserted that question, that action, etc. well, that's exactly what you do. You insert it there, you cut out the rest of the conversation and you replay this in your mind, the conversation up to that point and where you inserted what you would have done and what you've effectively done, you've created an instant habit because the next time you're in an environment that is similar to your brain, your brain is going to default to that new picture that you've just painted in the brain. Isn't the brain wonderful what you can do with it? Eh? Next steps. Absolutely your call. You can realign your values and focus to achieve your destiny. I trust these insights to self-leadership to encourage you to stand up and step out in strength and good health. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your journey. And I'll now hand you over to Danny for closure. Thank you so much, Tracy. I must say it's been such an insightful um, webinar to listen to you and to, to, to listen to what you've got to share. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you to the, the everybody who's on the call um, for the insightful questions um, and engaging questions. We so appreciate it. Um, I wanted to say that some of the big things that I learned from this webinar was, you know, a lot of us are in this in this phase and in the in the position where we are self aware of some of the things that are happening to us. We're self aware of what what is what's triggering us and what's what's happening. However, there's a bit of a, a, a gap to bridge bet between being self aware and being emotionally regulated and knowing how to yeah. respond to those situations. And in there lies the work. Lies the work with generational trauma. Lies the work with um, Noticing what's in your internal locus of control and out and external locus of control. Yep. Um, knowing what are social expectation and actually what's what is actually your values and morals. Um, so I want to encourage everybody on this call to do that work. Um, do the work for yourself, journal, make a note of it, however you feel. Speak to us, speak to us, Nelson. Do that work so that you can get to that point of emotional regulation to to be in that 
I almost want to call it woke for lack of a better word. I, I, I don't know what the old term is for that, but <laughs> for the, the current term to be woke and, and live your life knowing what's happening, knowing how to react to things, knowing um, what best way to respond in the best interest of everybody involved. Um, I thank you all for joining. If anything has triggered you or if you are wanting to do the work, I encourage you to make contact with Austin Nelson. Austin Nelson offers you a range of services, including counseling, coaching, legal and financial advice as well. You can contact the team, whether you're in South Africa or outside, through various ways on the screen. I encourage you to take a photo of this, the screenshot. Um, otherwise, these, the recording for this will be emailed to you and made available on the link that I've shared on the chat box a couple of times. Um, up next, next month, um, I am going to be co-hosted by Dr. Zaheen Omar. Um, some of you may know him well. Um, he is a medical doctor um, and he's going to be talking to us a little bit about HIV and AIDS in our world today. Um, with, with us coming to the close of COVID um, and, and the pandemic, I think that there's been a little bit of focus lost on this such an important topic within South Africa. So please feel free to share, share the, or join us on the day. Um, share the link with everybody you work with, with your family and friends. It is open to anybody who would like to join. Um, until then, go well. Um, Tracy, thanks again. And um, have a blessed November. See you in December. <laughs> thanks, Paul.